Hello everyone, and thank you for joining me. I'm Tracy Harris, and this is At Home in My Head, the podcast that explores experience and meaning and their impact on individuals and the broader society. My last posted video was labeled as a documentary and involved a protest in support of a ceasefire in Gaza. I felt strange labeling it as documentary, but according to YouTube policies, if something's reported as problematic, it's reviewed differently if it's content that's documenting a newsworthy event, but it has to be clearly labeled as documentary. While I personally would not find the content of that video to be in breach of YouTube's community guidelines, The perspectives on this issue are varied, and noting that I was recording a public event offers some measure of protection against a takedown or complaints about the video. So if you viewed the footage and found it strange to label it as a documentary, I don't disagree, but the way YouTube considers content, I was literally documenting an event, and if the content might be controversial, pointing that out using the documentary designation is how a creator can say, these are things that happened at this public protest where a lot of things were said, some of which might upset some folks. I even put a warning at the front of the piece to give people a heads up in case that's the kind of footage that might negatively impact them for any reason. I've talked some about driving and how I have some, let's call them, unique driving patterns. Additionally, there are some situations that I dislike immensely. One is driving downtown. I also don't like driving anywhere I'm not familiar. Until I feel I have a good handle on the roads and signals along a route, I experience stress and anxiety when I drive it. One of the things I hate about driving downtown is the parking situation. I don't like parking on the street with meters. The lots are always confusing when I get to the pay station, and the public garages have wildly varying prices. The protest was being held at City Hall, rather than the Capitol building, and it was not long after another pro-Palestinian protest that was held at the Capitol, where three protesters were targeted and attacked after the event. When I say they were targeted, I'm not being assuming or hyperbolic. Reading from an NPR transcript about the crime, quote, Zachariah and his friends were in their car at a stop sign when a man riding a bike yelled racial slurs and attacked them. The man identified as 36-year-old Bert James Baker tried to rip a free Palestine flag from their truck and then stabbed Zachariah in the chest. Baker was arrested and charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Austin police on Wednesday said it was recommending the attack be prosecuted as a hate crime. Whether to do that is now up to the Travis County District Attorney, unquote. I've been to protests and rallies before. I've done the Women's March, and I've even spoken at the Capitol for one event that was held coincidentally at the same time as an NRA rally. I even engaged some of the NRA folks in what were civil exchanges, but this was the first time I was ever nervous for my physical safety going to attend an event like this. It wasn't just me. I went with a friend of mine, and before we left, their husband thanked me for going along. He was staying home with their child and also had concerns. I drove in spite of my discomfort with driving downtown and parking, and we ended up parking in a public garage just a few blocks from the venue. The garage elevator was locked, and we had to use the stairwell, which was very air-conditioned, and on the way down, there were various signs of life, such as food containers and blankets. As we were walking to the rally, we passed a bus stop and municipal benches, and everywhere you looked were folks you could tell were struggling with housing insecurity and poverty. I commented to my friend about the irony of it, that we were on our way to a rally to halt violence against people in Gaza and practically stepping over people along U.S. streets being subjected to our own form of quiet violence. We were moved by displacement and homelessness in Gaza, And protests were happening globally that day. It was March 2nd, which had been designated as a global march and rally day for the ceasefire. But in the U.S., we've grown so used to displacement and citizens starving and in need that it barely registers. And day in and day out, we really aren't solving this very solvable problem. We have an over $4 trillion annual revenue with a $6 trillion spend, 
and if we just paid rent for every unhoused person, we're talking about roughly 650,000 people, half of them children, so they'll be living with someone else, and then their couples, and some of those children will have siblings, so we can cut one-third of that number right off the top. Then let's estimate another 10% for the other situations, which is probably low-balling, but let's say that in terms of housing, we would need about 391,000 rents paid every month. Let's say they're staying in modest accommodations spread across the country, so some rents will be higher and some will be lower, so let's ballpark it at $1,000 a month. Knowing some can deal with studios and some are going to need more bedrooms, that's $391 million. Multiply that by 12 to see what we're talking about for a whole year as part of an annual budget, and we're still under $5 billion out of an annual spend that's more than $6 trillion to end housing insecurity. Not by coming up with ingenious solutions and not by building special communities, just by paying their rent. And think about what would be saved in ending the programs in place that provide services for people without housing because they'd now have housing. So yes, I do see the irony of walking past people living on the streets to protest people being forced from their homes. The situations clearly are not the same, but there are similarities, and both issues deserve attention and solutions urgently and relief from the systems of oppression that bring violence upon them both. But we got to the rally, and everything went smoothly. I posted the footage, and then we walked back to the garage. When we got to the car, my friend said, Oh no, your door handle broke off. Did someone try to break into your car? I told them I've had trouble in the past with door handles, and indeed they do come off pretty easily, and I was explaining and unlocking the car and getting in when I realized that my car actually had been robbed. My glove box was open and all the contents were strewn across the vehicle. The phone chargers were scattered on the floor and the back seats, and I unlocked the doors and just said, yeah, someone robbed my car. They picked up the door handle, and I hurriedly gathered all the things and just set them on the back floorboard. I thought about reporting it, but there really wasn't anything to report. I don't keep valuables in my car, and outside of the door handle there wasn't any damage. I've replaced two handles already. They're not expensive, and they're easy to install. As it turned out, when I got home, my roommate just put the one that had been ripped off back on. It actually wasn't damaged, it was just removed. Nothing in the car was broken, and for that, I was grateful. I'm glad they didn't smash a window, especially since there wasn't much in there to steal. I had an ancient bag of tollway quarters that I couldn't even remember the last time I used one. And frankly, I think whoever took them will get more and better use out of them than I would have, which would likely have been none at all. I don't know how much they took, and I don't care because, as I said, I wasn't using it. It just sat there from the days when I used to do road trips with my ex, so whoever took it, they're welcome to it. I hope they got something useful with it, like food or even something comforting. If that's drugs or alcohol, I really don't care. As human beings, they deserve a whole lot more than a bag of quarters, so take it and use it well. And thank you again for not bashing out my window. On a humorous note, I'm actually an ordained minister, and I had my clergy tag in the glove box. I wondered if they even noticed that when they were pulling out the contents, and if they thought it was funny to rob a minister. My actual thinking is that they weren't paying a lot of attention to anything that didn't look like quick cash, so they probably didn't even notice it, but it would have been funny if they did. And that's my here's what happened to me recently opener. But let's get to the subject for this episode. We're going to start out by talking about the TikTok ban. That's not what this is about, but it's part of an overall topic that this is going to be about. So let's talk TikTok. And let me add my usual disclaimers. I'm not an expert. However, the information I provide is what anyone can find doing even the slightest bit of research and reading. I use mainstream sources, nothing fringe or conspiratorial. I include my sources in the description, so what I'm about to say is just facts. And any experiences that are my own, I will clearly label, as well as the opinions of others who know more about this than I do. In the news recently, you'll have heard about the U.S. government in a bipartisan push trying to ban TikTok unless its owner, ByteDance, sells it to the U.S., 
I talked last episode about Yanis Varoufakis' thoughts on this. The U.S. government claims it's a security concern, but even our intelligence sources admit that any breaches are completely hypothetical, and many have pointed out that the U.S. companies collect much of the same data that TikTok collects. What's interesting is that the main selling point for the ban is that TikTok is a Chinese company. But that alone really isn't enough to ban the app. And calling it a Chinese company obfuscates the global nature of the company. The concern is that at some point, Beijing could exert influence over TikTok and use information gathered by the app, information similar to information gathered by all the other social media apps, to some nefarious end. It's true that TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, is headquartered in Beijing. But it's also true that TikTok has never operated on mainland China, something its CEO, Xu Chu, from Singapore, wants the U.S. government to know. TikTok was first incorporated in 2015. The app was available in Hong Kong until 2020, when a sweeping and controversial national security law was passed that had an icy effect on speech. So, weirdly, TikTok pulled out of Hong Kong due to national security concerns that would have made problems for the app's operation in the region. Now the U.S. is trying to force a sale by using the same sorts of national security concerns. When Trump was making it his business to rail against China during COVID, TikTok took great pains to show itself as an independent entity. China actually doesn't even use the app. They have their own version of it called Duyin. Duyin has actually been around longer than TikTok, but TikTok used a similar algorithm philosophy that has proven successful in the global market and made the app a sensation, especially with younger people. With regard to the app itself, TikTok, not the parent company ByteDance, when CEO Chu was asked whether the company was Chinese, he repeated that the app isn't used in China and that it is headquartered in both Los Angeles and Singapore. And for U.S. audiences, I should probably add that Singapore is an island nation and not a city in China. I wish I could say that that was a joke, but I don't rely on U.S. geopolitical knowledge when it comes to something like this. But again, it is a subsidiary of a company in China, ByteDance. And I'm not trying to deny this. I just want to make the point that there are loads of global hands in the TikTok pie saying it's Chinese focuses on a thin slice of stakeholders and provides a perspective that erases a lot of other associations for the company. So just as an example, when I Google, can Chinese investors own majority shares in U.S. companies? The first hit is an article at Investopedia telling me that, quote, there are no citizenship requirements for owning stocks of American companies. There are some extra hoops that non-U.S. investors may have to jump through before investing in U.S. stocks because foreign owners and holders of U.S.-based assets are subject to an array of U.S. laws intended to protect U.S. interests, unquote. It further clarifies the intent of these restrictions as, quote, one of the goals of the Patriot Act of 2001 passed following the 9-11 terrorist attacks was to prevent individuals with any links to terrorist activities from funding their illegal activities through the American capital markets. The act led to brokerage firms implementing more stringent requirements for verifying customers' identities, particularly for non-U.S. citizens. Part of this legislation also requires stockbrokers to report any suspicious account activity to the U.S. Government Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. However, these regulations obviously do not impact the majority of international investors because the vast majority of investors do not have any criminal associations, unquote. In other words, as long as you're not doing terrorism, buy as much stock as you like. So if Chinese investors stepped up to buy out majority shares of a U.S. company, would that still be a U.S. company? Because that's totally legal, apparently. But you see my point, I hope. Determining ownership based on influence of an international company that operates globally isn't a direct line between two points. In fact, Here's a convoluted logic the U.S. government is using to call TikTok a Chinese company or a Chinese-owned company. The app is owned by TikTok LLC, a limited liability company incorporated in Delaware and based in Culver City, California. The LLC is controlled by TikTok LTD, which is registered in the Cayman Islands and based in Shanghai. 
That firm is ultimately owned by ByteDance LTD, also incorporated in the Cayman Islands and based in Beijing. In fact, you may have heard that GOP presidential candidate Donald Trump recently flipped his position on the ban within the last week. He's now opposing it after recently meeting with GOP megadonor Jeff Yass, whose company holds a 15% stake in ByteDance. I don't want to downplay the idea of obfuscating ownership or influence. We know how dark money works and hides behind a maze. We know why shell corporations are used to shield people from liability. But in this case, the chain of association is hiding in plain sight. Nobody's denying these associations, but the U.S. government is laser-focused only on one point in a larger bucket of points. And unlike shell corps and dark money influence, TikTok has been incorporated since 2015, nearly a decade now. And U.S. intelligence can't point to a single instance where U.S. fears of Chinese nefarious influence over the app has ever happened. In fact, when I look to see if China has ever launched a military assault on the U.S., I can't find anything. If I look to see if they've ever threatened to launch an assault, I can't find anything. If I look to see if the U.S. has ever fought a proxy war with China, I find people talking about how we've definitely been on different sides of conflicts in other countries, but nothing like what we saw in the Cold War with the U.S. and Russia. I mean, we sometimes have disagreement with nations we call allies over sides in conflicts in other regions. Does China do human rights abuses? Yes. Does the U.S.? Yes. Does China crack down on dissent? Sure. Does the U.S.? Sure. I mean, I have episodes dealing with that. Oh, and this is going to be an episode dealing with that. In fact, ironically, this TikTok ban is arguably one example. Our leadership is trying to force an incredibly popular social media app that has operated in the U.S. now for nearly a decade and that has literally done nothing wrong to sell to a U.S. corporation. But we wrap ourselves in free market and free speech while we're doing all of this. When Verifakas talked about it, he made the point that what terrifies the U.S. about China is that China can compete. China's not a threat to U.S. citizens. It's a threat to U.S. global market dominance. U.S. tech dominates around the globe, except in China, where they have bigger and better products, according to Verifakas and some friends I have who have lived there. China isn't handing over its substantial population to U.S. market share, and it's developing product that is competitive. But as the U.S. is a nation that claims to love competition and to love the open market, we aren't practicing what we preach. In fact, every time I see conservatives panicking on social media threads about China buying U.S. real estate, I like to point out that their arguments boil down to, quote, the U.S. should be more like China, unquote. These free market loving what's mine is mine, the government can't tell me what to do folks instantly want to control who you're allowed to sell your property to the minute they realize non-white people have the money and capacity to buy it. I've even seen them directly argue that China would never allow this. I'm not being at all hyperbolic when I say that they are arguing we should in the U.S. operate more like China. They hate China, and their number one complaint is that we're not more like China. I once attended a lecture by Catherine Stewart, author of The Good News Club. It's a nonfiction book written in 2012 in which Stewart chronicled a situation with her daughter in elementary school where a conservative Christian group started a club for the kids. They used a lot of dishonest tactics to lure the children in and entice the parents to think that it was an interfaith tolerant space for the kids and that the school endorsed it. When she started looking into it and pushing back on it, she began to realize something that she summed up in the lecture as Christian nationalist philosophy. If they can't own it, they'll burn it down. And since that time, I've seen that same defunding and political assault on our public schools and the funneling of public money to private religious education in the form of vouchers and under the label school choice. As I was watching and reading the info about TikTok, I kept thinking of that line. If the U.S. can't own it or at least exercise influence over it, not just TikTok, but anything we can't control. We become terrified of it. We vilify it and attack it, often violently. 
That's our foreign policy in a nutshell. Play ball with us economically, or we'll do everything we can to make sure you can't play ball at all. Recently, a phone call recording was leaked in which Jonathan Greenblatt, head of the Anti-Defamation League, can be heard saying, quote, we have a TikTok problem, unquote. He's not talking about a U.S. national security issue, though. He's talking about how young people are using the app to share images and information on events in Gaza. Many outlets have reported on how IDF members have been posting videos of their operations and behaviors that many people find disturbing and even criminal in some cases. And the app allows people to share real-time or recent images of victims of bombings, snipers, phosphorus, amputations in hospitals operating without power, without anesthetic, without antibiotics, and most recently children starving, literally to death in what's left of some of these hospitals that are still attempting to function, all while food and medication sits at the border, blocked by Israeli citizens posting videos of themselves in what appear to be tailgate-type parties, singing and laughing about their goal of collective punishment, and it turns out that the U.S. youth are seriously turned off by these displays. So yes, if your goal is to maintain support for Israel, TikTok is not your friend. Upcoming generations are less and less inclined to support what they're seeing on their live streams. I mentioned last time that even Meta has stated that they're going to throttle political posts in a presidential election year. When you realize that support for Israel is a bipartisan position, that both parties are defending aid to Israel and U.S. support of Israel, and you understand that social media is undermining it, suddenly things like banning TikTok and selling it to a U.S. company, or a U.S. company like Meta operating platforms that make money on engagement that starts choking political posts in a super contentious election year just months before the presidential election, start to make sense. The youth vote is moving farther and farther away from our U.S. two-party system, and in fact, this whole American experiment. The Congress member, Mike Gallagher, who authored the TikTok ban bill, not only took money from APAC, but they were also his top donor. And just as an aside, that's something else I don't get. Foreign nations are not supposed to be allowed to donate to election campaigns. Can you imagine if a congressperson had China as a top donor and was trying to pass legislation to support China in a big way? Remember the pushback to the idea that Trump took Russian money? That they'd use that money and influence with him to insert themselves in U.S. policy? I was confused about this, about how our laws figure out which countries can contribute and which can't. What I found, in a nutshell, is that any nation can donate as much as they want to any election campaign as long as they use dark money routes of setting up foundations and other entities to launder their contributions and then go through a super PAC. I don't want to paint APAC as some unique thing in this regard. This is a U.S. campaign finance problem more than an APAC problem. But it's hard to miss the irony of the U.S. government putting the screws to TikTok out of fear of foreign U.S. policy influence, for which there is no evidence, while sucking up PAC money like a vacuum cleaner even when it's a PAC that openly advocates for the interests of a foreign nation. So, I mean, feel free to stick with the China is coming for us and TikTok is their weapon of choice narrative, But for me, that doesn't wash. It's just not a satisfying explanation because there's too much that doesn't make sense to me in that narrative. As a sideline, I had written something up that was scrap, just a thought about satisfying and unsatisfying narratives. It's a complete aside, but this seems like a good spot to insert it. I recently watched a couple of documentaries about genocide in Myanmar. Apparently, there's a group there called the Rohingya, who are Muslim, and the majority Buddhist population has a major hate on for them, even though they're basically impoverished refugees who just want to live without being harassed. And by harassed, I mean slaughtered, abused, tortured in ways that you should prepare yourself for if you plan to watch documentaries about what the f*** is happening in Myanmar. 
And yes, I mean happening because it's still going on. But it made me think about satisfying and unsatisfying narratives, and I thought I'd share these thoughts because I don't think I've ever considered why some stories satisfy me and others don't. In a Frontline documentary, the narrator said, quote, Under international pressure, the Myanmar military would eventually conduct an internal investigation. It concluded there was no rape, no burning, and no killing of civilians by its soldiers. They maintained the campaign was a counterinsurgency clearance operation against Bengali terrorists, unquote. You hear this line after seeing overwhelming evidence and testimony of what actually happened, not just in this one case, but all over the place. In response to the findings of the self-investigation, Ziad Rad al Hassin, the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights, says during an interview, quote, rubbish. I mean, this is not counterinsurgency. Counterinsurgency means you go after the specific units that are involved, but rounding up civilians, burning their houses, slicing the throats of children, raping pregnant women, and then disemboweling them. I mean, how on earth is that counterinsurgency? These were not sporadic acts. These were well organized, well thought through. Clearly, it didn't seem to be an operation that was put together at the last moment. There is some design to this. This was a textbook case of ethnic cleansing, unquote. It was impossible for me to listen to this without thinking, what if someone giving the Myanmar military money and arms were to say, but we're also trying to get medical supplies and food to the Rohingya people. What if they were asked why they continue to give Myanmar money and arms? And they say, Myanmar has a right to defend itself. Asked if it looks to them like this is a campaign of self-defense, they say they don't condone the burning of houses, the raping of women, and the slitting of throats of children. Well, does that answer satisfy you, or does it leave you with a sense of being unresolved? Because this is a parallel to an exchange the White House National Security Communications Advisor John Kirby had with a journalist at a press conference recently. A journalist asked, what part of starving people to death is self-defense? John Kirby was arguing to say that the White House will not condition military aid to Israel on civilian aid to the citizens of Gaza, while children have now started dying of starvation. Kirby says he separates these into two different issues, humanitarian aid for Gaza and military aid for Israel's right to defend itself. I know there's a debate about an occupier defending. There is also a FA debate basically an apologetic talking point intended to distract that there is no occupation. But when I control your airspace, your coastline, your borders, when I can cut off your food and water and your power, I'm the one in control, no matter how I'm delegating that. This is why there is near zero international debate about the fact of an occupation of Gaza. And anyone who wants to try and make that argument can make it elsewhere. It's not a serious position. The journalist then asked Kirby how starving people to death is self-defense. Kirby again said the administration does not agree with blocking humanitarian aid. He explained that this is why the world is watching all these ludicrous plans and tricks to get aid in by air and by sea, even while the U.S. was instrumental in defunding the largest and most capable aid agency, UNRWA, and while the U.S. continues to ignore the fact that all the necessary aid is sitting on the border, just waiting for approval from Israel to enter. And then there's the issue of when it is let in, a small drip at a time, can Palestinians safely access it without being massacred? But Kirby is playing a trick here. Israeli self-defense is the justification he gives for supplying the military aid. When asked if starving children is self-defense, he says they disagree with holding back the aid from the starving children. But that's not what was asked. The journalist didn't ask whether the administration thinks withholding aid is okay. He asked whether withholding aid from civilians is indicative of a nation whose goal is self-defense. What this journalist question is driving home is this. If your goal is honestly defending yourself, then why are you starving civilian children en masse? That's the question John Kirby has sidestepped. 
It's why his answer feels so unsatisfying, because he isn't addressing that the narrative of self-defense falls flat when the steps an occupying power is taking are clearly not aligned with a goal of self-defense. This is not what self-defense looks like. So if the justification for military aid is self-defense, can you, John Kirby, explain how the behavior we're witnessing is indicative of a goal of self-defense because it looks more like scorched earth. And if the goal is scorched earth, that's not self-defense. And that means the justification for the military aid is then undermined. When Kirby says the administration disagrees with withholding humanitarian aid, it's an open admission that to the White House, Starving civilians to death en masse does not really line up with what self-defense looks like to them. If it did, Kirby would defend it as part of Israel's self-defense. So then the question becomes, if we all agree that what we're seeing can't be explained by a goal of self-defense, why are we using self-defense as our justification for sending military aid? For most of us, this would result in cognitive dissonance to acknowledge that the behavior of Nation X doesn't fit the defense narrative and that our justification for sending military aid is Nation X's behavior that is about self-defense. Narratives need to fit the facts to feel satisfying, and that's why Kirby's narrative feels so dissonant and unsatisfying, because he's trying to hold two fact claims that are inconsistent. If it doesn't look like self-defense, then how can self-defense be your justification for it? In the U.S., we have a problem with school shooters or mass shooters. Imagine that a school shooter gets into a school and starts causing carnage. SWAT arrives, and they arson the school to the ground, killing everyone inside. They say they wanted to stop the shooter and save the children inside. I mean, maybe stopping the shooter is true because they did that effectively. But there's zero reason to believe that using this method was about saving victims or even taking care to minimize the violence against them. In fact, it would show not valuing the victims at all. Now imagine the mayor gets up and announces his support for the brave folks in blue who showed up to stop this shooter and save these people in the school. It would never fly. That narrative doesn't feel satisfying intuitively, and it's because it doesn't fit the facts. So you sense there's something wrong, even if you're not completely sure what it is. Just to be clear, just because an interpretation does fit the facts, doesn't make it true, but it does make it more satisfying. And when something isn't satisfying as an explanation, it may still be true. Maybe we don't have all the relevant facts to make it make sense, for example. But this is why I say in my intro that I focus on meaning. What things mean to us is what shapes our lives. So when SWAT shows up and burns the building to the ground, that's going to mean something to people. It will convey a meaning for most of us that the cops didn't care about the people inside the building, or perhaps that they were wildly incompetent to the point that it's not really possible to believe they could be that incompetent. But one person might say that they just don't care about citizens. Someone else may point out that the principal was having an affair with the SWAT commander's wife and this was all a plot to kill the principal and they didn't care about anyone else or anything else. I can't really control what things mean to people and I recognize things mean something to me. And all my biases will be in play with how I interpret events and behaviors and how I react to them. I don't deny this. And I don't pretend to be able to know to what extent that's happening with me versus someone else. And I don't trust anyone who can't own that about themselves. No one is objective. All of us are saturated in experiences that shape meaning. What things mean to us is fundamentally who we are and what our reality is. But there's a word for satisfying narratives. We say they resonate. Resonates is just a word that means 
This satisfies my need for an explanation. This fits the facts as I understand them. This explains the situation in a way that doesn't leave me with dangling doubts. And we'll stick with that narrative until and unless we encounter new facts that make it unsatisfying for us again, in which case it'll be undermined and we'll feel as though something's not quite right until we come across information that makes it satisfying again, or that creates new meaning and a new narrative for us, and then we'll feel satisfied again with the new construct. And that's all I have to say about that. Back to the topic of this episode. I was talking to a friend of mine a few months ago, and they mentioned that their brother used to be very involved in activism, specifically Occupy Wall Street. Remember that? Remember Occupy Wall Street? If you're like me, when you heard that title, you thought, oh yeah, I recall that movement, people milling around and camping out in cities, lots of complaining about banks and wealth inequity and capitalism and our predatory economy. I remember one big criticism that was leveled at it, that there weren't any clearly defined goals. And I'm not even saying that's true. I'm just saying that these are things I remember about it. But my friend has been wanting to get more involved in activism and as a result had wondered about their brother and realized they didn't really hear much from them on activism anymore. Hadn't for a while, so they were wondering out loud as we talked about what had happened to all that activism. I saw them a while later, and I asked them about what their brother had to say, and they started to tell me a story that sounded very familiar. He said he didn't want to be anywhere near it anymore, that he was being surveilled by people, harassed by local police, and that his phone was being monitored. Ten years ago, I would have laughed and called this paranoia or conspiratorial. But after the episodes on free speech and COINTELPRO, and after reading more about surveillance on Black Lives Matter and Muslim student groups, I don't laugh at this anymore because it's no joke. If your movement is determined to be effective at challenging the current systems, it's targeted. If you, as a leader, are determined to be charismatic and magnetic enough to be able to build coalitions... You're destroyed or disappeared, as Fred Hampton showed me, even if your goal is only to feed hungry children. But this was an unsatisfying narrative because I didn't really recall the state reacting to Occupy Wall Street like a threat. The media and commentary I remembered seemed to focus around joking about how the movement had no focus or demands. Was the state really threatened by young people pitching tents in public parks and wandering the streets with posters? I didn't recall any violence or militarized police lines, no images of head-busting or boot-stomping. It seemed pretty benign, and commentators treated it as though it was actually kind of silly, so why would it get cointelpro Wikipedia says that it lasted a total of 59 days from September 17th to November 15th, 2011. And just as a refresher, here is the wiki summary of what kicked off the movement. The motivations for Occupy Wall Street largely resulted from public distrust in the private sector during the aftermath of the Great Recession in the United States. There were many particular points of interest leading up to the Occupy movement that angered populist and left-wing groups. For instance, the 2008 bank bailouts under George W. Bush administration utilized congressionally appropriated taxpayer funds to create the Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP, which purchased toxic assets from failing banks and financial institutions. The U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Citizens United v. the FEC in January 2010 allowed corporations to spend unlimited amounts on independent political expenditures without government regulation. This angered many populist and left-wing groups that viewed the ruling as a way for moneyed interest to corrupt public institutions and legislative bodies, such as the United States Congress. The protests gave rise to the wider Occupy movement in the United States and other Western countries. The Canadian anti-consumerist magazine Adbusters initiated the call for a protest. The main issues raised by Occupy Wall Street were social and economic inequality, greed, corruption, and the undue influence of corporations on government, particularly from the financial services sector. The OWS slogan, We Are the 99%, refers to income and wealth inequality in the U.S. between the wealthiest 1% and the rest of the population. 
To achieve their goals, protesters acted on consensus-based decisions made in general assemblies which emphasized redress through direct action over the petitioning to authorities. The protesters were forced out of Zuccotti Park on November 15, 2011. Protesters then turned their focus to occupying banks, corporate headquarters, board meetings, foreclosed homes, college and university campuses, and social media. End quote. But honestly, what I was mainly interested in, now that my friend had spoken to me about their brother, was what stopped the movement? Why did it end in November? It was benign. It was broad. It actually kicked off a lot of other global sister movements. So how and why did it die? There was one other thing in the wiki article that ties into something else I want to share. So let me read this as well about the Occupy venues. The original location for the protest was one Chase Manhattan Plaza with Bowling Green Park, the site of the Charging Bull, and Zuccotti Park as alternative choices. Police discovered this before the protest began and fenced off two locations, but they left Zuccotti Park, the group's third choice, open. Since the park was private property, the police could not legally force protesters to leave without being requested to do so by the property owner. You may remember the Occupy slogan, We Are the 99%. It actually made the phrase, the 1%, popular as the label applied to that small slice of the population that owns the vast majority of wealth. The man who came up with that slogan was a man named David Graeber, an American anthropologist and anarchist activist. I'm not going to get into Graeber as part of this episode except to say that in his wiki entry, He claimed to have been evicted over his affiliation and role in the Occupy movement, and he was on record saying that there were others associated with the movement who had received what he referred to as administrative harassment. He called the movement the opening salvo in a wave of negotiations over the dissolution of the American empire. He said that the movement was about committing to answering to moral order rather than legal order. And in my head, I keep going back to that Star Trek quote from the last episode, I have a feeling we're helping him. It seems that more and more, all of our systems are focused on openly serving that small percentage of people at the top and trying to tell us that they're serving us. Google U.S. bailouts. I could remember a few, but it seems that there are many. The first hit I got was the Saturday Evening Post, an article titled, The Five Biggest Bailouts Ever. It starts with the automobile industry from 2009. Number two is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in 2008, but it appears in that case they paid back the treasury eventually. Number three is insurance giant AIG, which earned the title, Too Big to Fail, popularized during the 1984 bailout of the Continental Illinois Bank. Number four is the airline industry after the September 11, 2001 attack on the U.S. that included the Twin Towers as one of the targets. And back to the auto industry in 1980 for a bailout of Chrysler. It's interesting that the article asks if the bailouts were successful in each case, and it judges the success based on whether the companies became profitable again or not. Something I learned is that companies that receive a bailout are generally asked to pay the government back in some way. But I also found a very interesting thing called the bailout tracker that is housed at ProPublica. It lists all the companies that have been bailed out and which ones appear to have defaulted in red shading. It also lists those who weren't required to pay back the taxpayers in red letters in the net outstanding column. This is money we paid through public funds to keep a for-profit private company afloat without asking for anything in return. I was going to do some tallies, but honestly, I'm including a link to the tracker in the description, and I just encourage you to have a look at it. The first default listed is General Motors, who stuck us for more than $11 billion. And in the don't have to ever pay us back category, the first one listed is a mortgage service that left us holding the bag for more than $5 billion. A lot of them are in the hundreds of millions, and then they dwindle to ultimately thousands. Still, it seems we put in public tax dollars to prop up private enterprise, but 
When we ask for public assistance programs, we're told to be happy that these companies provide us with jobs and that if we get benefits on top of that, it's all the social support we need. Years ago, companies used to offer pensions as a benefit. You worked a certain number of years and then you retired and your company paid you a set amount for the rest of your life. Today, this has moved to retirement accounts where you save money for your own retirement. It's important to note that not all jobs offered pensions and not all jobs offer 401ks. So this is not a universal, but I'm using it as an example of how we're helping them. So during my lifetime, the number of people invested in stocks has grown and the rise of the 401k is a big part of that. Pretty often people will put their money in the stock market options because they have the greatest potential for growth, but the more growth, the more risk. So companies and the government are working together to encourage citizens to save for retirement. The government allows you to save pre-tax income that you'll be taxed for later if you invest in the stock market through your 401k. Again, you can invest in other things, but if the goal is building a nest egg, those other products won't get you there. And the general consensus is to move your money slowly into those low growth, low risk products as you near retirement to keep your money a little safer from market fluctuations. Right now, there's a lot of fuss about Social Security, raising the age, ending it all together. I'm not sure what all has been floated. But it's not stable at this point because it's become a political football. So no one feels certain if, whether, or how much it's going to be available in future years. And these 401ks are keeping people's money at risk. Stock money is also a big part of how people like Elon Musk, the super wealthy, protect their wealth. None of us are taxed on stocks while they remain in stocks. Once they're sold, you pay on gains and you report your losses depending on how your gamble went. If you're a billionaire, most of your wealth is also tied up in the stock market. But if you have a billion dollars and you lose half of that, you're still sitting on half a billion. For the rest of us, if half our stock value tanks, we're screwed. For someone like Musk, it just means less fun money. For you and I, it would be less money available to actually live on. And the fact we're basically pushed into it, if not straight up coerced into buying stocks in order to survive retirement years, means we're contributing to Musk's wealth a lot more than to our own on an individual level. So for us, it's promoted as a great opportunity to save for our own retirements, but in the end, it's private for-profit companies and executives who have their money invested in those stocks who benefit the most by far. And the rest of us have to do the best we can and hope the market doesn't tank and take our life savings with it. And this is for folks, as I said, who are even lucky enough to make enough to save. And those of us with companies that offer any sort of benefits package. It just seems more and more that public money isn't going to help the public. That citizen money isn't going toward taxes to provide a robust social safety net for people. I would rather my 401k contributions go to pay taxes to ensure that all of us can relax and not worry about retirement than to gamble in a stock market to build an account that only benefits my own retirement and in fact benefits wealthy corporations and wealthy citizens far more than it benefits me. And not everyone is going to agree with that. Those are my values. And I suspect a lot more people share them than don't, just based on the fact that people worry a lot about how they're going to pay for things like health care and housing and retirement. I don't believe most folks enjoy that stress, even if they can pay their bills. I feel like we're being funneled into this, not like we're choosing it as a citizen majority. I don't think it was put to a vote whether people wanted to give up pensions for 401ks. USA Today just published a piece about this in March. It describes how, quote, companies moved toward defined contribution plans like 401ks, which shift the risk to employees. Employees became responsible for funding their retirement plans with the company sometimes agreeing to match a small amount. They are also responsible for investing and growing their money and deciding how much, if any, to withdraw, unquote. 
And while in general, I think more control over the things in your life is good, the fact is financial products are a specialty expertise these days. We offer degrees in finance for a reason. Making the average employee responsible for running their own investments, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say is not the best idea. Anyway, I'm going over long, but going forward, nobody is going to remember pensions unless they're public sector. People are not going to see how we were shepherded away from pension plans and into these investment accounts and why and who benefits the most. It was just another small area where our citizen security was chipped away, and if Social Security goes, then we'll be even more reliant on private corporations because there will be nothing available as a public safety net for retirement. We will all be at the mercy of whatever offering the private enterprise decides to hand us. They're taking away our collective power by giving our taxes to wealthy corporations and individuals and taking it away from us using it to benefit ourselves. Then they're telling us that helping private enterprise is helping us, and I don't see it. It seems like the public takes the risks. The public does the saving. Even as they sit on a mountain of wealth and resources, any time there's trouble, it's us saving them. They are too big to fail, but guess who isn't? us. We're allowed to lose our homes, our farms, our chemo treatments, our retirement savings. If we lose everything, well, we should have planned better. But if they lose everything, it's, dang it, they should have planned better, but I guess we have to save them because over the years our fates have become so coercively tied into their financial health that we will suffer when they fail. So yes, they're too big to fail, but maybe that's too big to allow. Maybe that's too much power for any person or company to have over the public. If it's too big to fail, then maybe it's too big to exist. I'd rather bail out the 653,000 homeless citizens in this nation than a private company in a nation where we consider public oversight to be too much of a constraint. I recently saw a meme with a quote from Noam Chomsky. It said, quote, That's the standard technique of privatization. Defund, make sure things don't work, people get angry, you hand it over to private capital. Unquote. And now, more than ever, we're seeing companies move to subscription models and planned obsolescence. We're seeing college costs and housing and cars being sold at shocking prices, and we're told that we can get really good loan terms. We used to be able to pay a doctor directly without paying a monthly insurance premium and get vet care for our pets without using scratch pay or getting pet insurance. I'm watching my society move from a society where the goal was to own your own home, own two cars, from a nation that valued owning things to one where everything is only ever rented or financed and where we're paying on everything forever. And more disturbing is that costs are rising faster than wages. We're going to own nothing, be in constant debt, and have no social safety net, and be at the mercy of the wealthiest individuals and companies on top of the private sector. And our government is enabling this slow walk takeover of the nation by oligarchs. We're being converted into a national company town. Googling, I just came across a piece called You'll Own Nothing and You'll Be Happy that seems to be tied to this concept. To be clear, I'm not saying ownership is necessary on the road to happiness. If we had a national model where all the land was public and owned by everyone, I would be open to considering that. But this is not that. This is about ownership of resources necessary to live, being in the hands of just a few private entities who make decisions about how they're distributed and what they cost the rest of us. If ownership is not available to anyone, that means we all have claims to the resources. But when ownership is available but denied to 99% of us by 1% of us. Anyway, that's a nightmare for another day. 
I did want to mention one thing that I saw recently that was disturbing. It was an elementary school lesson for fifth graders. It read like a corporate ad pitch for government subsidies. Research and development is the cost associated with private enterprise. I mean, at the end of it, if we're going to be funding the research, the development, subsidizing underpaid workers with food and housing vouchers, gambling our retirements for corporate stocks and transferring public education funds to private schools and stepping in to save corporations when they behave badly or have to deal with life like the rest of us, I'm quickly wondering what that private capitalist lair is offering. The public and the taxpayer is doing all the work and footing all the bills and covering all the costs, and these private enterprises just absorb the profits and complain about public oversight. Just to read a little bit from one of the lessons, it says, Government must fund inventors, and then it starts out, Every year, our government collects trillions of dollars in taxes. Most of the funds pay for programs that keep citizens safe and healthy. Other amounts fund programs such as public education. Some of the money goes to run the government itself. It's expensive to keep our country running. So yes, the government that is supposed to be of the people, by the people, and for the people pools our money to provide us with public services. Seems pretty straightforward that a society would come together as a collective for the common good. Public safety, public education, public health, I think most of us get it. But then it takes a bit of a hard turn and says this. Sadly, just a small percentage goes to fund innovation and invention. In recent years, the government has spent only a small percentage of the federal budget on scientific and medical research. This is not right. The federal government must spend more money to support inventors and their work. At first blush, it sounds reasonable enough, right? The government should fund research into science and medicine. I mean, that's tied to public good and public welfare, right? Grants to predict large damaging storms for things like NORAD and the National Weather Service, things like the FDA that perhaps regulate food and drug safety, of course. But that last bit, it's not right that the government isn't spending more to support inventors and their work. That's where it starts to depart from government funding of government research and move a bit into subsidies for billionaires. And if you think that's iffy, get a load of the next paragraph. Invention is crucial for the economic and social well-being of our country. Funding inventors improves people's lives, creates jobs, and helps our nation excel as a leader in science and technology. The focus here is on the private tech industry, and in fact, it continues. Inventors change our lives for the better. Government support of innovation has always benefited society. Specifically, government funds have contributed to inventions such as cell phones, electric cars, and the internet. Okay, let me stop here for a minute. Cell phones, electric cars, and internet companies. At Statistica, it says revenue from smartphone sales is forecast to reach close to roughly $102 billion, and that was from 2023. This is a private, for-profit company. You and I don't get those profits. We get a job. I googled cell phone companies and randomly chose T-Mobile and asked the internet about its wealth. The top question was, how much money did Steve Sievert get paid? The answer is, the stock awards included a one-time special equity award of $20 million in April 2020 following Sievert's promotion to CEO. Additionally, T-Mobile paid Sievert a one-time retention bonus of $3.5 million on top of his base salary of $1.4 million, contributing to total cash compensation of $5.1 million. The internet claims he's got an estimated net worth of about $100 million. But you and I get a cell phone and are told that we need to pay for his company's research and development so we can then buy cell phones and sell service that we're supposed to pay to research and develop. I have a feeling we're helping him. 
Okay, next on the list, electric cars. I think everyone thinks Tesla. So I'll just go with Tesla. We all know Elon Musk, the man who can flush $44 billion down the toilet and still be a multi-billionaire. I have a feeling we're helping him. Internet companies. AT&T comes up first when I Google. So let's go with AT&T. The CEO is named John Stanky. And the internet tells me that he was one of AT&T's most highly compensated executives in 2021. I'm guessing things haven't changed much in two years, but let's see. Online, it says that in 2022, he received total compensation of $24,820,879, representing an 18% increase from the prior year. It includes a larger than average salary and a cash bonus that more than doubled from the prior year. That's one year. I know we're helping this guy. And we're teaching our kids that taxpayers need to pay for his company's research and development because we now rely so heavily on cell phones. Again, funneled into them. It's near impossible to exist without one if you don't like living like Ted Kaczynski. So yes, these things, quote, contribute to society, unquote. But private enterprise is supposed to be its own arena. Public taxpayers are shouldering all the burdens and they're siphoning the profits while we stress about making rent. And they use their money to make the top wealthiest people in the world even more wealthy. Let them take some of that exorbitant compensation and pay some of their own research and development. Then it goes down a really bizarre path, still reading from this lesson. It's the government's job to improve the lives of its citizens. Inventors do this all the time. Think about the contributions of inventors like the illustrious Thomas Edison. Who can doubt that his light bulb made life easier? Think of computer giants like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, whom many revere for how they changed the world. The government should be doing all it can to help new inventors follow in their footsteps. I decided to look up Edison to see how much government funding went into his light bulb. The internet says that in 1878, Edison formed the Edison Electric Light Company in New York City with several financiers, including J.P. Morgan, Spencer Trask, and members of the Vanderbilt family. Private, not public. That's how I've always envisioned it. Private companies find investors to pitch their ideas, and if they seem like good ideas that will catch on, the investors invest. I mean, that's such an iconic model that the show Shark Tank basically condensed it into episodes. That's how this has always worked. When the government invested in the space program, NASA was the big dog and the companies worked for the government to create public projects using private contractors. Today, it's shifting. It's not in our heads. It really is shifting into this idea that public tax money needs to be ever more creatively funneled upward to wealthy people who then sell us back goods and services in a model that's becoming more and more about keeping us all constantly in debt or in payment models that have no end in sight. We're just sources of income and fall guys for the wealthy. And for younger listeners, yes, wealthy people were always exploitative. But this is getting us back to robber baron company store era stuff that we really do not want to ever see again. All of this needs pushback. You want to follow in Edison's footsteps? Get private investors to fund your private products and to cover your ass when you fuck up or don't have any contingency so we don't need to bail you out. They are merging public and private, but not in a way that serves the public, in a way that serves by far the private wealthy capitalist class. The lesson wraps with a pitch for bailouts. Yes, inventors make mistakes and your money could be lost, but it's all good. That's really just reality. Failure is part of the learning and inventing. Here's the last couple paragraphs. Even failures help investors learn. Now some people might feel that invention is too risky a business for the government to be involved in. Yes, most investors do fail at first, 
but failure is a central part of the process. It's how great ideas become great products. In 1967, for example, an Apollo spacecraft caught fire on the launch pad. Three astronauts died. Inventors learned from this terrible accident. They made improvements to the spacecraft. The improvements helped astronauts land on the moon. That's the end of the lesson quote. But see, this is the thing about Apollo. It was a public program, not a private one. It wasn't us sending tax money to SpaceX. Yes, we hired private contractors to help with the project, but it was the public Apollo project, and nobody was confused about who owned it. We owned the risks. We owned the results. Again, Kirk and Khan from the last episode, it may look like they're helping each other, but one of them is definitely in possession of more power when it comes to making decisions. I personally do not feel empowered any longer over this government or over these corporations. I see more and more how they're using me and not helping me. And this feeds into today's topic of Occupy Wall Street, because if you, like me, are feeling more and more divided from that 1% and more like they don't see us as partners but as pawns, it only seems more troubling the more you start to look into their alliances and behavior toward everyday citizens who pursue the shocking and horrifying crime of opening a public dialogue to talk about how we might consider closing some of this wealth gap. So picking up where we left off, after my friend had told me about their brother, I found it curious that someone would get COINTELPRO treatment for that Occupy movement, even at the organizer level. But I wasn't that involved with it. I just remembered it being mocked a lot, that folks thought it had a good point about wealth inequity, but it lacked focus, and it seemed to be mainly folks camping out in parks. If you followed it more closely, you might be shaking your head at me, but I think for most of us on the sidelines, that's what it seemed like. But it bothered me how the things their brother described were so very aligned with government response to protesters. At some point, though, the whole movement just melted away. And after that conversation I had with my friend, I didn't really think any more about their brother after that. But then I came across two things. In one instance, I found a talk by Chris Hedges on the situation going on in Israel. And I've noted that I've been pretty consumed with that, so I gave it a listen. I was shocked at the end of it during the Q&A when someone asked him a question and Occupy Wall Street came up, totally unexpectedly. Here's a transcript of that question and the answer. Question. Do you think the groundswell of people coming together in protests powered by social media makes any difference as compared to other and earlier genocides? Answer. It always makes a difference. It may not end the genocide, but it calls out the hypocrisy of the ruling class and it scares them. Anecdotally, I was very involved in the Occupy Wall Street movement in Zuccotti Park. And at the same time, a faction of my family, unfortunately, works on Wall Street, my cousins. And they were terrified of Occupy. I know this from them. They were getting hourly updates. Now, Occupy was one of the most benign, peaceful, Quakers in sandals kind of movement, but they're marching down Bond Street. They have a big puppet of a squid. And they, meaning his cousins, wouldn't even go out to the restaurants. They brought paper bag lunches to eat in their offices. The fact is, this is a whole other discussion on the destruction of American democracy, which I've written extensively on, but in many ways the ruling oligarchic corporate class that has seized political power, and of course the media, is illegitimate. And it knows it. And so when people go out in the street, it scares them. And in the end, politics is a game of fear. That's what it is. And I did cover the revolutions in Eastern Europe. I was in the Magic Lantern Theater every night with Václav Havel and Prague, the playwright. And these despotisms, and I think this is what's happened in Israel, devour themselves. You can't underestimate how important it is to get out and protest. But I would also say it's important, terribly important, for the Palestinians who feel often forgotten and erased. In the end, I didn't go to journalism school. I graduated from Harvard Divinity School, and I come out of a religious tradition, and I look at that kind of resistance as a moral imperative, that it's not whether we're going to win, 
That's the wrong question. The right question is that it's where we have to be and where so many, especially the young, you go to the protests in D.C. and it's really encouraging because they're young, they're smart, they're articulate. That's where we have to be. I'm not going to guarantee that we're going to win, but I don't fight fascists because I'm going to win. I fight fascists because they're fascists. And that's the end of his answer. This got me to thinking about my friend's brother. What Hedges was describing explained why Occupy would be surveilled. So I looked at it more and found the following section in Wikipedia in the article for Occupy Wall Street in a section titled Government Crackdowns. And before I start, just remember that I like to use very general common resources for these talks because it shows that none of this is deep dive conspiratorial material. It's very high level. Anyone can find it sort of stuff. Nothing anyone has to go digging for. It's right there hiding in plain sight. It's just that we don't generally go looking for it. And if we don't have some reason to, we won't see it. So it just doesn't get a lot of attention. But here it is. Before I start the quote, let me just say, their first link is to an internal document of the United States Department of Homeland Security that shows that the U.S. government was closely monitoring these protests. The document is only five pages long, and it's linked from the article, and it's still posted at the DHS website if anyone wants to go look at it. So here's the quote from Wiki. As the movement spread across the United States, the United States Department of Homeland Security began keeping tabs on protesters under the pretext that the protest was a potential locus of violence. Following this, there was a DHS report titled Special Coverage Occupy Wall Street, dated October 2011, observing that mass gatherings associated with public protest movements can have disruptive effects on transportation, commercial, and government services, especially when staged in major metropolitan areas. The DHS keeps a file on the movement and monitors social media information. On December 21, 2012, Partnership for Civil Justice obtained and published U.S. government documents revealing that over a dozen local FBI field offices, DHS, and other federal agencies monitored Occupy Wall Street despite labeling it a peaceful movement. The New York Times reported in May 2014 that declassified documents showed extensive surveillance of OWS-related groups across the country. The first person arrested was Alexander Arbuckle, a student videographer from New York University engaged in a class project. The police department alleged he was blocking the street. However, video shown at his trial showed the protesters, including Arbuckle, had followed police orders and withdrew to the sidewalk. Gideon Oliver, who represented Occupy with the National Lawyers Guild in New York, said about 2,000 protesters had been arrested just in New York City alone. Most of these arrests in New York and elsewhere are on charges of disorderly conduct, trespassing, and failure to disperse. Nationally, a little under 8,000 Occupy-affiliated arrests have been documented by tallying numbers published in local newspapers. In a report that followed an eight-month study, Researchers at the law schools of New York University and Fordham accused the New York Police Department of deploying unnecessarily aggressive force, obstructing press freedoms, and making arbitrary and baseless arrests. Let me just stop here for a minute. At this point, the article is describing exactly what my friend's brother was claiming he experienced. So, going back to the article... On October 1, 2011, a large group of protesters set out to walk across the Brooklyn Bridge, resulting in 768 arrests, the largest number of arrests in one day at an Occupy event. By October 2, all but 20 of the arrestees had been released with citations for disorderly conduct and a criminal court summons. On October 4, a group of protesters were arrested on the bridge, filed a lawsuit against the city alleging the officers had violated their constitutional rights by luring them into a trap and then arresting them. In June 2012, a federal judge ruled that the protesters had not received sufficient warning. Video of his arrest was convincing evidence in Alexander Arbuckle's acquittal. In 2011, eight men associated with Occupy Wall Street were found guilty of trespassing having intended to set up camp on property controlled by Trinity Church. 
One was also convicted of attempted criminal mischief and attempted criminal possession of burglar's tools for trying to slice a lock on a chain link fence with bolt cutters, spending a month in prison. The rest were sentenced to community service. In May 2012, three cases in a row were thrown out of court with most recent one for insufficient summons. One defendant, Michael Premo, charged with assaulting an officer, was found not guilty after the defense presented video evidence which showed officers charging into the defendant unprovoked, contradicting the sworn testimony of New York PD officers. In April 2014, the final Occupy court case, the trial of Cecily McMillan, began. Cecily McMillan was charged with and convicted of assaulting a police officer and sentenced to 90 days in Rikers Island Penitentiary. McMillan claimed the assault was an accident and a response to what she claimed to be sexual assault at the hands of said officer. The jury that found her guilty recommended no jail time. She was released after serving 60 days. End of the wiki reading. So yeah, aggressive, lying police, federal-level surveillance justified by a claim that a large gathering can get violent, no actual crime committed, all of this tracks. Before I move on to my next point, I want to read the summary in that five-page DHS doc posted at the wiki article. Summary Since the initial September 17th protest, which drew 1,000 participants to Wall Street, OWS-inspired groups have staged protests in upwards of 70 cities across the United States, including most major metropolitan areas. The largest gathering to date came on October 5th when an estimated 15,000 protesters marched on Wall Street and the New York Stock Exchange. In addition, OccupyTogether.org, an OWS-affiliated website, lists over 1,500 geographically unique online communities in 25 countries seeking to participate in the demonstrations. As the movement has spread, it has garnered increased media attention, significantly expanded its demographic base, and co-opted support from labor unions, social action groups, and the hacktivist collective Anonymous, among others. Social media and the organic emergence of online communities have driven the rapid expansion of the OWS movement. In New York, OWS leaders have also formed ad hoc committees to organize protesters and manage communications, logistics, and security. The OWS encampment in Zuccotti Park features a medical station, distribution point for food and water, and a media center complete with generators and wireless internet. Organizers hold general assembly meetings twice a day and have established committees and working groups including an internet working group and a direct action committee which plans protest activities and works to maintain peaceful and controlled demonstrations. This high level of organization has allowed OWS to sustain its operations, disseminate its message, and garner increasing levels of support. The growing support for the OWS movement has expanded the protest's impact and increased the potential for violence. While the peaceful nature of the protests has served so far to mitigate their impact, larger numbers and support from groups such as Anonymous substantially increase the risk for potential incidents and enhance the potential security risk to critical infrastructure. The continued expansion of these protests also places an increasingly heavy burden on law enforcement and movement organizers to control protesters. As the primary target of the demonstrations, financial services stands the sector most impacted by the OWS protests due to the location of the protests in major metropolitan areas, heightened and continuous situational awareness for security personnel across all CI sectors is encouraged. That's the end of the summary. So in spite of the disparaging descriptions issued in the media, that I recall clearly about the movement being nothing but meandering, disorganized campers with signs, it was actually quite well organized according to this assessment. In fact, the amount of coordination and organization is noted in this document and directly attributed to their ability to work through social media. I've mentioned before that when Musk took out Twitter, those folks who aren't his fans often laughed at how his mismanagement destroyed the platform rather than making it successful. But the fact is, it was successful as a platform for organizing, especially for marginalized communities. I know because I followed many of them, from all walks of life and from a diverse group of communities. 
He opened the floodgates to mainstream voices, the status quo, and gave the platform over to all the bigotry and oppression that folks were using it before that to escape from. People were communicating and organizing and information sharing about movements toward equity, and all of that was scattered to the wind. TikTok picked up a lot of the slack, but was also a good platform on its own. Seeing that OWS was focused on more wealth equity and taking out classist hierarchy, I think it's at least worth noting that destroying the platforms used to organize movements to that end serves both oligarchs like Musk and our government that more and more seems to serve the interests of the 1% over our own. If you ask me to prove this, I can't. But I don't think it's a coincidence that a financier like Musk undermined Twitter and the U.S. government is doing all it can to force a sale of TikTok to a U.S. corporation. In the last episode, I talked about how the U.S. has a lockdown on global tech and how China threatens that. I referred folks to Giannis Varoufakis, who has some really good insights and analysis on this. I am no expert, but he is far more into this and is worth a listen if you want to understand it better. But the U.S., for all its talk about freedom and free speech rights, is expert at shutting that shit down when it actually becomes effective at changing the status quo. It reminds me of the sandbox analogy I used in the indoctrination episodes. You can dig down as deeply as you like, but not outside the box. Our Constitution provides for change, but not for how to implement a new Constitution. And that means change has to happen slowly so that folks in charge under the current system have time to work out their responses before things get too far and too much change is affected. The best example is how we responded in the U.S. to slavery, as I've discussed that before as well, It moved according to the Constitution so that it was able to be continued. It changed form, but it's still with us, because really ending it was too much change. We had time to react and set up a loophole to compromise penal slavery so that black codes could then be put in place to simply shift plantations to prisons and move the working populations from one system to the other to still coerce free slave labor. When black codes fell, we still had Jim Crow to fall back on. And when that fell, we had to get more creative and work within something called the Southern Strategy. But if someone suggests we create a new and improved constitution that doesn't make us work around things like slavery or disenfranchisement of women, that allows for health care and housing and food as a constitutional right, well, that's subversive dissent and now you're running afoul of the law. Our founders don't seem to have anticipated what we would need to do if we decided later that this constitution just doesn't work and needs to be replaced. What is that process? Or maybe they did anticipate it and the answer was simply, you can't, because they wanted badly to retain a status quo where the minority of wealthy white men ran the nation because demographically, when you look at the tops of every power structure in this country, that's still who is in charge centuries later. So if the plan was to make it difficult to undo that, they did a brilliant job. Because even now, wealthy white men are using our military and our domestic law enforcement to protect their interests against equity and justice for the rest of us. Our tools and our techniques have become more sophisticated, but our mission to create systems to protect and defend capital in the hands of people in privilege is still the mission and still as solid as ever in its grasp on systems of power it uses to protect that status quo. But there was something in Hedge's answer that I wanted more info about. He said that his cousins on Wall Street were getting regular updates, hourly updates, in fact. What was that about? Why would the FBI be reporting to bankers about a peaceful protest where authorities appear to be the main ones committing the crimes against citizens exercising their rights in public spaces? Well, it turns out because of something called the Domestic Security Alliance Council. Again, hiding in plain sight. It's not a secret society. It's an actual federal agency that was formed at the request of corporations who said they wanted a public-private partnership agency to work with the FBI 
to bridge the information divide between America's private and public sectors. According to Wikipedia, quote, the program facilitates information sharing and cooperation between the FBI and over 509 of the largest American companies, which altogether account for over one half of the gross domestic product of the United States and employ more than 20 million people. In December 2012, released documents showed that the DSAC and counterterrorism programs conducted surveillance of nonviolent Occupy Wall Street protesters in 2011, unquote. Now, it's bad enough that the FBI is surveilling citizens who aren't breaking any laws or being violent. It's bad enough that authorities are harassing people and trumping up fake charges against them. It's bad enough that our courts are giving people unusually harsh sentences in contrast to jury recommendations and compared to the fact that Trump encouraged a huge mob to rush to the Capitol to destroy it, disrupt an election, and hunt down the vice president and house speaker. Oh, and put nearly 150 cops into the hospital. And he could be president again before that ever goes to trial. All of that is bad enough. But who is the FBI working for? We are the people. We are the public. And we are the only ones left out in the cold here. It seems the FBI reports to and serves everyone here except the people who actually pay for them to exist. Are they a government agency or are they the Pinkertons? Last episode, I talked about how private for-profit business is using our military as private security on the high seas. Now they're using our federal law enforcement to police the citizenry? The cops are violating the citizens while the cops partner with Wall Street and report to them? They need to report to us. Why are my tax dollars going to federal law enforcement agents only to have them harass citizens for protesting and engaging in the public square? Why are they reporting on us? to corporations. Don't misunderstand me. If the FBI or the CIA or any government agency gets wind of some sort of attack like 9-11, I understand they want to be able to notify parties that may be impacted. But that is not what this is. All of us, I would hope, would get that same treatment. If they thought there would be some weird attack on the city where any of us live, I want the FBI to notify the city and the citizens and put folks on alert and help us understand how to stay safe. But I don't ask them to set up a special agency where they report to me about illegal aggressive surveillance on other citizens who haven't broken any laws. This is COINTELPRO in partnership with our largest corporations, headed up by some of the wealthiest citizens against citizen protesters. The membership list includes Citibank, Bank of America, Boeing, MasterCard, Coca-Cola, Walmart, and more. If I were an oligarch who was terrified that protesters might undermine my wealth and power in an evil plot to create more global equity, I'd want to be on this list. So none of these names are surprising. It would be surprising and actually even more scary if it were a list of companies nobody had ever heard of. And I'm just going to go ahead and read the full section in the wiki article about domestic surveillance here of Occupy Wall Street because it's not really that long, so here it goes. Following successful Freedom of Information requests by the Partnership for Civil Justice Fund, the FBI released redacted documents on December 2012 showing that the FBI had spied on Occupy Wall Street organizers and passed OWS information to financial firms via the Domestic Security Alliance Council prior to the first OWS protests in Zuccotti Park. FBI officials met with New York Stock Exchange representatives on August 19, 2011, notifying them of planned peaceful protests. FBI officials later met with representatives of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond and Zions Bank about planned protests. The FBI used informants to infiltrate and monitor protests, 
information from informants and military intelligence units was passed to DSAC, which then gave updates to financial companies. Surveillance of protesters was also carried out by the Joint Terrorism Task Force. DSAC also coordinated with security firms hired by banks to target OWS leaders. And let me stop right there for a minute. This Domestic Security Alliance Council was coordinating with security firms hired by banks to target the OWS leadership while they're partnering with the FBI to get inside information that is being illegally gotten through infiltration and spying on citizens who are not breaking any laws. Back to the article. Previously, in December 2011, DSAC had written a report on law enforcement agencies' plans for a 12 December protest at U.S. ports, which involved investigation of links between OWS and port trade unions by the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. The Partnership for Civil Justice, a nonprofit, said that espionage facilitated by DSAC treated protests against the corporate and banking structure of America as potential criminal and terrorist activity, and said that DSAC was functioning as a de facto intelligence arm of Wall Street and corporate America. Naomi Wolf wrote in The Guardian that surveillance of OWF by the FBI was conducted with the knowledge of the Obama administration. A DSAC brochure states that the benefits of membership in the DSAC include centralized access to security information not only from the FBI, but from all federal government entities, including the Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, the IRS, U.S. Coast Guard, and the U.S. Secret Service. Ongoing access to a network of diverse security experts at the highest government and corporate levels. Continuing education for CSOs, through the semi-annual Domestic Security Executive Academy at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. Continuing education for intelligence analysts through quarterly regional intelligence analyst symposiums, additional opportunities through participation in DSAC committees. Those early bullet points, I think, are the most terrifying Corporations are embedded with our government here. They're working together with them in illegal operations against us. The article mentioned a piece in The Guardian. Let me read you how Naomi Wolf at that outlet summarized this problem. Quote, It was more sophisticated than we had imagined. New documents show that the violent crackdown on Occupy last fall, so mystifying at the time, was not just coordinated at the level of the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and local police. The crackdown, which involved, as you may recall, violent arrests, group disruption, canister missiles to the skulls of protesters, people held in handcuffs so tight they were injured, people held in bondage till they were forced to wet or soil themselves, was coordinated with big banks themselves. The Partnership for Civil Justice Fund, in a groundbreaking scoop that should once more shame major U.S. media outlets, why are nonprofits now some of the only entities in America left breaking major civil liberties news, filed this request. The document, reproduced here in an easily searchable format, shows a terrifying network of coordinated DHS, FBI, police, regional fusion center, and private sector activities so completely merged into one another that the monstrous whole is, in fact, one entity, in some cases bearing a single name, the Domestic Security Alliance Council and it reveals this merged entity to have one centrally planned, locally executed mission. The documents, in short, show the cops and DHS working for and with banks to target, arrest, and politically disable peaceful American citizens. The documents released after long delay in the week between Christmas and New Year, show a nationwide meta-plot unfolding in city after city in an Orwellian world, 
Six American universities are sites where campus police funneled information about students involved with OWS to the FBI with the administration's knowledge. Banks sat down with the FBI officials to pool information about OWS protesters harvested by private security, plans to crush Occupy events, planned for a month down the road, were made by the FBI and offered to the representatives of the same organizations that the protests would target, and even threats of assassination of OWS leaders by sniper fire, by whom, where, now remain redacted and undisclosed to those American citizens in danger contrary to standard FBI practice to inform the person concerned when there's a threat against a political leader. The documents show stunning range. In Denver, Colorado, that branch of the FBI and a bank fraud working group met in November 2011 during the Occupy protest to surveil the group. The Federal Reserve of Richmond, Virginia, had its own private security surveilling Occupy Tampa and Tampa Veterans for Peace and passing privately collected information on activists back to the Richmond FBI, which in turn categorized OWS activities under its Domestic Terrorism Unit. The Anchorage, Alaska Terrorism Task Force was watching Occupy Anchorage, the Jackson-Mississippi Joint Terrorism Task Force was issuing a counterterrorism preparedness alert about the ill-organized grandmas and college sophomores in Occupy there. Also in Jackson, Mississippi, the FBI and the Bank Security Group, multiple private banks, met to discuss the reaction to National Bad Bank Sit-In Day. The response was violent, as you may recall. The Virginia FBI sent that state's Occupy members details to the Virginia Terrorism Fusion Center. The Memphis FBI tracked OWS under its Joint Terrorism Task Force Aegis II, and so on, for over a hundred pages. Jason Leopold at truthout.org who has sought similar documents for more than a year, reported that the FBI falsely asserted in response to his own FOIA request that no documents related to this infiltration of Occupy Wall Street existed at all. But the release may be strategic. If you're an Occupy activist and see how your information is being sent to terrorism task forces and fusion centers, not to mention the long-term plans of some redacted group to shoot you, this document is quite a deterrent. End quote. So there's what Wiki and The Guardian have to say about what the released docs describe. And they are, in fact, available at The Guardian article if anyone wants to read them firsthand. But remember, boys and girls, TikTok is dangerous because, hypothetically, China might find a way to use it to spy on you. Just to be clear, TikTok is not what we need to be afraid of. Our own authorities and our corporations, they're who we need to be surveilling. As citizens, we need to be aware of what's happening around us in plain sight. None of this is them helping us. It's us paying our own abusers to work with our oppressors to continue abusing and oppressing us. How many of these agencies, how many of these stories, it's endless. And this protest, this movement was joked about because it was so sleepy. If ever there was a case study in how our government is not going to allow any amount of community organizing, this is it. No one ever accused this movement of violence or danger or threat. But they were still treated to the exact same abuses, threats, harassment as other movements who were, rightly or wrongly, accused of violence and branded, most often wrongly, as violent and terroristic. They see us, the citizen who wants to change society to be more citizen-friendly, as the enemy. Not because they're wrong but because they are cleaning up under the status quo of these systems in place. None of them are elected, but they have all of the money and the power in the palms of their hands, and their greed and their lust knows no bounds. 
I just reread The Hobbit the other night. And as I was reading about the impact of the dragon gold on various people, I kept thinking of oligarchs and how like dragons they are, just amassing wealth and sitting on a hoard, greedily guarding it and spending all their efforts on simply keeping it and making sure no one else has any more than they need to get by. They keep us hungry so that they can control us with food. Soon there will be no place on earth that they don't control because they aren't going to stop until they have it all. And then they'll only have to battle one another for control of it. They have literally doomed the planet over wealth, doomed us all. And that hasn't even slowed them down. It also didn't slow down Thorin in The Hobbit. It drove him and so many others likewise to destruction, and I was struck by how this greed and need to control the wealth ultimately destroyed so much. And as he lay dying, he reconciles with Bilbo, and he says, If more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. I really think that for most of us, That's all we want. The security of having a stable place to live, something to eat, some leisure time to have some fun or experiences we enjoy. It's not that these oligarchs are wealthy that makes them so hated. It's their abuse and oppression of everyone else, their greed and lust for more and more and more power. It's the system they want to set up that squeezes everyone else dry and leaves us with nothing certainly without financial security. We don't all want to be billionaires. We just want to live in a society where we are allowed to be happy and express ourselves as human beings, not as cogs in the machines of wealthy corporations. Before I sign off, a big thank you to Partnership for Civil Justice Fund at justiceonline.org, without whom what little we know would have never been known. My friend's brother would probably be treated as paranoid with an overactive imagination. The Partnership for Civil Justice Fund plugs itself as defenders of justice both in the courts and in the streets, and here is what they say about their mission at their website. Quote, For more than 25 years, the Partnership for Civil Justice Fund, PCJF, has been a leader in the fight to uncompromisingly defend democracy and advance constitutional rights by litigating landmark civil rights and First Amendment cases and providing robust defense to social justice activists and movements. Our work is focused on creating meaningful social and legal changes and dismantling systems of oppression." Unquote. As protests are mounting and more and more people are looking for ways to be active, Please, please be informed and be careful. It's great to want to support and be willing to show up, but I advise everyone who plans to start participating in activism to try and get with a group or find resources that can help inform you on how to stay safe and protect yourself as much as possible. These folks are not playing. They have a lot of power. Please be careful out there and look out for each other. That's it for this episode of At Home In My Head, exploring experience and meaning in individuals and the broader society. Like and subscribe if you enjoy these talks. And in the meantime, stay safe, be well, and never stop exploring.